I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Yes or no, did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. I had no prior knowledge of the planned assault on Nancy Kerrigan. I am deeply sorry for my irresponsible and selfish behavior I engaged in. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Oops! The Podcast. I'm a host of the show, Francis <laughs> Ellis. This is Julio Gallarati joining me as ever. How are you, Julio? Again. There he is. <laughs> right off the bat. Dude, I'm so self-conscious about that now. Why? I don't know. Because I because it's like a nervous tick. Like, for some reason, starting the show is like, oh, I'm going to now... I, I don't know. Like, I, maybe I'm in my head about it, and now I just I default to just swearing. Whenever we start the show, that's when I'm most comfortable. And then as the show wears on, I worry that I'm running out of steam. <laughs> but uh, that's when you sort of pick up the slack. So <laughs> I think it's it's fine. Listen, uh, how was your weekend? Well, dude, it was a rainy fucking weekend. That's it. And rainy weekends have a lot in common with weekends where the power goes out. Mm-mm. Disagree. Disagree. So what? What do you like? What don't you agree with? Well, you. Why do you think that rainy weekends? are like weekends where you lose power. Because you end up doing shit that's fun that you wouldn't have normally done. Like playing board games and sitting in a room and talking and like, you know, doing sort of activities that you don't need power for as much. That's fair. That's fair. However, losing power sucks. (laughs) Rainy weekends don't necessarily suck. You can make a rainy weekend fun. Losing power, you have to... Uh, not open the refrigerator as often because then you'll spoil the food. You have to reset all of the clocks after the okay, power dude, comes back this is, on. This is now a cultural difference because you're talking about losing power in Maine and I'm talking about losing power in the tri-state area. Okay, so what's where, the difference? Where you get it back in a few hours. Dude, we lose power in Maine. <laughs> you can lose power in Maine for days at a That's time. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's not... And granted, my parents live in a pretty rural place as well, and we would occasionally lose it for a few days, and it sucked ass. But like, I no longer think about that anymore. We had a gas generator. Did it work? Yes, but one, you had to have gas on hand. <laughs> Did you grow up in a place where you had to have gas on hand? No. Yeah, we had to have gas available That's insane. at the house. Okay. Feed the generator, Fran. Yeah. And then that's it. And you got to start the generator by pulling on the string like it's a lawnmower. (laughs) It makes such a ruckus. Oh, God. Such a ruckus. And it runs constantly while you need the power. Plus, our generator was not so big that it could generate power for the entire house. So there were only a select number of lights and machines that could be fueled by the generator and it so was, you wouldn't even try with the other ones would it like blow the generator if you tried with no we ha- we how allocated you, know? fuses. you can do that i think so jesus i think it was like you know the refrigerator obviously certain lights but the house was still quite dim mm. but i don't think the tv worked just off the generator so you know we had to be very selective right. and you just knew that you were sort of on a, a lifeline you had to live in a in a very spartan electrical manner until the power came back on and there was no telling when that might happen interesting well dude this reminds me of something actually and this is a little bit of a uh, we're straying from the subject at hand a bit here with this but i think we can easily circle back to it so i'd like to that's fine we like to circle so you recommended the show the mayor of east town yeah and i've been watching it and i've I think been enjoying it i think it. it's just mayor of east town mayor of east town whatever Not mayor, the mayor the mayor no i didn't say the mayor i said the mayor but mayor the mayor I knew it was mayor. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh-huh. I have a little bit of a problem with their portrayal of small town life. Did you see the SNL skit? I haven't gotten that. I haven't gotten far enough. So as long as it doesn't have spoilers, I'm happy to hear. Okay, about it. Oh, you haven't even finished it yet. I'm only on like the third episode. Oh heavens to Betsy! <laughs> well, SNL. To your point, SNL did a, a, a pretty funny skit. Which the first time I watched it, I didn't think it was funny, and then I watched it with a group of people who were like, "Have you seen this? You got to see it." Oh, that and then help. watching how much they enjoyed it made me enjoy it. Isn't more. it amazing how that happens? Yeah, and that's fair. Like yeah. sometimes you like realize what you missed. Yeah. Anyway. It was all about the specificity of the sort of rural Pennsylvania accent that they hit oh, so hard yeah, in that they do. show. 
They do. Murder my dirty. Boom. Boom. Pick up the phone. <laughs> I can't really do it, but I was, it's pretty funny. So that's funny. Keep going. Your um, point. So anyway, like I grew up predominantly in a very small town that, you know, there are parallels to that town. And like we weren't just a bunch of like incestuous blue collar morons. You know what I mean? And uh-huh. even like those of us who worked vocations uh, for our jobs and stuff were, that didn't mean that they were stupid. You know what I mean? Like the, how competent people from my town are at like fixing shit and doing shit, like the amount of skills they have compared to my friends in the city. It's an embarrassment how pathetic my city friends are compared to them, Hmm. which just leads me to believe that like, if you're from some like small town, it doesn't make you dumb or something. You know what I mean? That's what I feel like when I watch the town, I feel or when I watch mayor of East town, I feel insulted that they're like making fun of my upbringing. Wow. That's how I felt. Wow. That is, that is, uh, you are taking that show very personally. But like the way they even made Kate Winslet, they're like, make sure you like look like a softball player. Like in it, like. Yeah, her hair, to me, it was her hair, which was so poorly colored. Yeah, it's like, it's like. But that's, that's not to me necessarily a reflection of her small town roots. Okay, so the softball thing a, was the softball thing. I'm not meaning no, to offend but, any no, softball you, players. You, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. I mean, no, like, she's she is a hometown basketball legend, and that's the biggest claim to fame <laughs> that she has. But I think in painting her character the way they did, it's more of a choice of this is a woman who can't let go of things, namely the death of her son. Right, which is fair. Right, and she's. And she struggled to kind of grow past that. And she lives in this very small circle. People have their feelings about her. Yeah, and right. it's, she's always fighting against that. Yeah, fine. Th- those things are all fine. But I just mean, in general, the, the tone of how everybody in the town is rings as sort of like deaf to any sort of nuances of small town life. The way that I felt like Broadchurch did the same thing, to be honest. It's like these city slicker, fancy people write this show about stupid countryside people. And everyone loves it. All right. Well, let's let's try the shoe on the other foot for a second, right? Okay. What would have been, to you, a more fair portrayal of that small town? If they had shown some guy who was very adept at electrical wiring... No, like that's fine if he's good at that. But like, why does everybody in the town look filthy? <laughs> everybody in the town's filthy, except Evan Peters. Nobody showers. Who's Evan Peters? Is he the? He's the like sprightly author? detective guy who comes in. Oh yeah, say Zabel. Right. Yeah, I love that guy. He's he was great. in X Men. He was the really fast. He's guy amazing in, in American Horror Story too. He's great. That guy's a great actor. He's got a big career ahead of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's great. Right. Also, like the guy who's the dad of the of the dead girl, he is a guy. I think he, I think he has the same commercial ages as me. I see him in the in the audition room. Isn't sometimes. that wild? I know. Isn't that kind of? I always and it actually, he always kind of like is he acts sort of like a hot shot, and now I understand why because he is a hot. Yeah, shot. I mean that was a he's on show. pretty decent role. Yeah, that's great. But like the you know the drunk country guy with the truck and the gun and the like. It, I don't know. It annoyed me the same way that three billboards did. Like this sort of like not grasping the sophistication of people well and just like making stereotypes and throwing them out okay. there. Okay, all right. But, but all right, let's flip this for a second. Every rom-com that has ever been set in New York City kind of walks down the same path. Does it? I think it glorifies it, New York City. Sure, but, you know, it also... Every, there's always that shot of the sidewalk where the person is walking and there are 400,000 people yeah, yeah. bobbing along with him. That's real. And it looks like Tokyo. Right. And, and you have plenty of sidewalks in New York at certain times of the day that aren't that crowded. Okay, that's Which fine. leads to whenever you go to fucking Denver or some place and you run into like, ski lift operators and you have a conversation they're like where are you from you say new york and they say i could never live there it's too crowded okay that's fine like, well yeah, you know what true. You, should, you should see what brooklyn's like or fair yeah Th- yeah totally but i don't get mad but if you, you don't get why, mad julio and why because they're running a lift see there we go <laughs> 
with their banging their cousin on the chairlift at the in the gondola, <laughs> murdering their dirter. Dude, so <laughs> dude. Well, dude, like, but but this is like, what if you got in that chairlift and the guy was like talking down to you because he thought you were a moron because of some the way New York was portrayed. They talk which down to you because they think that you're a city slicker. They don't Maybe. think you know how to ski. They think you're a, okay, that's fine. a, a four day tourist wearing, you know, the most expensive jacket. Because I am right. <laughs> and I'm, look, only, I'm only skiing four days a year these years. Totally, and that you know, of, of course, that's its own. That's a thing. People from other places don't like other people. Like that's that's separate from you know portraying types of people as morons. You know, really quick. You, you know where it's <laughs> the worst? Where the xenophobia of ski tourists is the worst? South Korea. I don't know. Where? Jackson Hole. Uh, <laughs> You better believe Jackson Hole. They are not welcoming. Somebody sent us some Jackson Hole teachers. They haven't arrived yet, but apparently they're on the way. Jackson Hole is this is the mountain more than any other mountain I've ever skied where they are the least welcoming to people who fly in from. Is it because it's just all New York City people? No, it's just the, it's just the general ethos of the place. They're hostile. Yeah. They're cold. Yeah. Because a lot of people, you know moved out there and live out there and it's their mountain and they don't want you coming in and carving up all the powder mm -hmm. and driving up lift ticket prices and right. all that bullshit. There's something frustrating about living in a place where quote unquote more privileged people come for a part of the year and live a better life than you do in the place that you live. That's it. That's frustrating. But the irony is be. of course that so many of those people who moved out there are, were transplants themselves. They didn't, right, they right, didn't right. grow up in Dude, totally. Jackson Hole. They weren't, you know, I know, planting blueberry bushes on the side of the mountain as kids. I mean, dude, that's classic people shit, dude. You yeah, know, like you come right. to a place, people discriminate against you, and then, you know, 50 years later, you're the one discriminating against the new people. Yeah, but you know where that doesn't really happen that often? Where? Is New York. Because everyone here is from somewhere else. Right. I mean, yeah, I guess. Well, if you're if you're against a certain type of people in New York, you're just a racist. Right, right, right. There's just too many different kinds of people. Yeah. Dude, back back to your point. I, I'm all we're all over the place. Here. No, no, it's good. This is good stuff. Um, I had a good thought. You um, still feel you feel discriminated against by Mayor of East Town a little bit for their sort of simple portrayal of small town folk. Yeah, and dude, to be honest, like even when I'm kind of commiserating with my you know, pals who also moved to the city from a similar town. It bothers me when they talk about the town that they come from as a place where people are stupid, which people do do. And that's in there. They're wrong. You mean like, Oh, like where we're from. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean by that? Dude? Like people, like you're acting like we didn't come from a place that was cool or good. And they're wrong about that. I'm, I'm very proud of where I came from. Yeah, totally. I grew up in a Freeport, Maine. It's yeah. a town of only, I don't know. I know, I know. Maybe ten to fifteen thousand people. Maybe that's small, but maybe that's not. Or oh, let's put it this way: the biggest city in Maine is Portland, Maine, where that's twenty minutes from where I grew up, and that only had a hundred thousand people. Right. By city sizes, that's tiny, pretty small. But we love Portland, Maine. No, I know, I know. I'm I'm not suggesting you don't rep where you came from. I'm very proud. I, I, I'm saying as I, a general thought. I, but but. He, I guess my thought would be, do I think that the people where I grew up are stupid? And the answer is no. No. Right. But then again, there aren't very many movies that are set in Maine that portray Mainers as being stupid. Right. Any movie or thing that's ever shot in Maine is always about, you know, lobster and the beauty of the rocky right. coastline. Or survival. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, Witness protection programs. Yeah, no, totally. But dude, you know, this, the same way that when pe I'll be sitting at a dinner party, sitting across from some of the stupidest people that I know, and they'll be like, yeah, like in Alabama. And I'm like, dude, I bet you most people in Alabama are smarter than you. You're a moron. You know what I mean? Like, it's annoying this idea that like parts of the country are superior to other parts of the country. That we've We've talked about this at different times throughout the life of the podcast, but it's a stupid thing to do that. You're not, you're not right. People are not stupid because they come from a place. There are stupid people everywhere and there are smart people everywhere. Fine. Period. Fine. But there are 
massive areas of the country where the education gap is far worse than elsewhere. Sure. And that, and, that and, be and I know that because when I applied for Teach for America, they were basically like, you had to list the cities that you would want to work in and in, in rank your order. And they were like, look, if you're willing to go to the Mississippi Delta, mm -hmm. you can go tomorrow. Right. It is our highest need area. We need people to go there. It's like yeah, very poor. devastated. Cool. Great. And I went to the Mississippi Delta, you know, not that long ago. And I saw plenty of people who seemed like they had their shit completely together also. So to that point, you have to be very specific to start talking about place. If you just say middle America and, and, and act like that's a fair thing to say, middle America is like this. You are an idiot for saying that. Yeah. People who say that are wrong. I think that's, I think that's, that, I get that. I get that. But then people in middle America say that the coasts are sn snooty and liberal and kind of socialists. I think there is a general blanket, uh, you know marginalization from both sides no totally uh and it's usually unfortunately like wrong wrong on both counts absolutely and you know the only reason why i am sort of sticking up for the rural uh population is because i feel insulted by the mayor of east town but how do you <laughs> how do you identify because you've straddled both worlds? I have, I know. And and you know, I don't think that because I moved to New York City, I am now better than the people that I grew up with. Cuz I'm not. No, but you also grew you are also born in New York. I was born in New York I I was born in New York City. I lived here when I was little, very little. And you know, my migrant parents like classic fucking, you know, New York shit and then my dad got a job and we moved to rural Connecticut. Like rural no street lights. Connecticut, you know, mm. uh, the woods, whatever. And, uh, you know, I came back here after blah, blah, blah. Um, but what was the name of the town you grew up in Haddam, but Hig Higginum technically, but like greater Haddam. I don't even understand how it works. Higginum is part of Haddam, but Higginum has its own, mm. uh, zip code. Shout out Higginum, Haddam, Higginum. Um, nice. So I don't know, whatever. Dude, my dad always tells this, this story and I think he's wrong about it. But this is a funny thing. So to talk talking about the ski instructors in Jackson Hole, he'll tell this story about like some rich New York City guy who goes down to the Caribbean and he's on a boat and he's fishing and the guy's asking him about his life. And he's like, so what do you do? He's like, you know, I work so hard. Like I'm a banker. I make so much money, blah, 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 which nobody talks like this. I'm like, dad, this is already stupid. Um, a banker, I make so much money. And like once or two, one or two weeks a year, I get to come down here and enjoy myself. And then the fisherman's like, well, I live here all year. And that's supposed to be some like mind bending, mind blowing realization. And I don't agree with that, that story. Oh, hang on. <laughs> the banker says to the fisherman, what do you do? So and the I fisherman says, I, I live here all year. I don't know that the banker has asked the fisherman. And I don't know if that's intentional in the story that the banker only cares about himself and doesn't ask others about themselves oh is that the moral the more no the moral is that the fisherman lives a much more normal life and he gets to enjoy the thing that the banker only gets to enjoy for two weeks for the entire year. oh i get it that's fun that's a fun little um i don't agree with it little though. story yeah i don't agree with that why not because if you're fishing if you live in the heat and you're fishing the whole year and there's no seasons like you get sick of that like it's nice to be able to afford variety in your life mm. you know what i mean so like you have to assume that the fisherman in the story, this simple life he's living, maybe he hasn't been able to go to other places or like do other cool shit. Like I, I think it's oversimplifying the, who do you think is the happiest person you've ever met in your life? Dude, as my shrink once said, you cannot judge others exteriors and compare them to your interior. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, there's too much to unpack there. <laughs> I can't even begin to peel that onion. Who do I think is the happiest person that I know? Okay, in all your travels, right? No, no, this is this is too much of a question, so I'm going to try to help you a little. Okay, thank you, Francis. In all your travels, in all your lives and jobs that you've lived and worked, uh, you've run into so many different people. I'm trying to think of like the fisherman in your story. Okay, I have an example, maybe. Who is deeply and thoroughly satisfied with their life. Okay, here's an example. 
and I don't know if this is like a cultural thing. This guy that I, this stood out to me as being a thing that I thought was interesting. This guy I knew who used to teach tennis with me, he, uh, his name was Bubakar. He was a very nice guy, always very happy. He would work fucking eight hours straight in the morning every single day. I think he would take Monday off. And he always had a smile on his face. He was always happy. He always had something positive to say. And one time we, it was his birthday. And we're like, oh, dude, you're getting older. And he said some shit like, oh, it's good to get older, man. You know, you people respect you more. And I was like, oh, that's a, what a good way to fucking, mm -hmm. but maybe that's because where he's from, that's true. Because I know here people fucking toss the elderly away. Yeah, I mean, clearly he's never <laughs> gone to war in the comments of a TikToker. <laughs> You know, that guy struck me as a very happy guy. Booba, if somehow you're hearing this and you want to weigh in and tell me that you're not that happy, that would be that would be interesting to yeah. explore. Agreed. And Booba, if you're listening, just so you know, I don't necessarily respect you just because you're older. <laughs> That's how I feel. Do you have an example of someone that stands well, out to you? It's happy? funny. When we went to Jamaica, there the guy that picked us up from the from the airport. What was his name? He had some kind of funky uh nickname like cakes or or bones or something something like that i don't know what it was cakes and bones hang on a second hang on she doesn't she doesn't want to talk about stuff with me right now she's on a call so <laughs> we're just gonna go with bones okay but it was more pleasant than that um you liked bones i yeah he, this guy picked us up first of all everyone in jamaica obviously true to true to the stereotype seemed very happy but this guy his job was just to run people from the airport in montego bay to the resort mm -hmm. in a van Got it. and it's like a two-hour drive jesus was this did the hotel arranges for you mm -hmm. cool you need to pay for it but um like 100 bucks i think it was like 130 each way oh, god but it was better than paying for a cab yeah we're renting a car so we we got a ride with this guy and the whole time he was talking to us and he just, he had a laugh and a smile and a pride in what he did in his home and an excitement of meeting new people. He liked to share stories of past guests whom <laughs> he'd given rides to. One time he gave a ride to Shia LaBeouf oh, wow. and Shia liked him so much that Shia gave him the the watch on his wrist. Wow. It was like a tag. Damn. Here. Here. And <laughs> and uh <laughs> and he stopped on the way and let us stop at this jerk chicken place to try their jerk chicken, which was like in his opinion the best. You know, didn't charge us any more for the added time. That's very nice. And uh, that guy, in my mind, just sort of stood out as a guy to me who had his day, and that was Made everything he needed. That's wonderful. Whatever day. happened in his day was exactly how the sticks were meant to fall. Mm -hmm. And what may be, may be, tomorrow was going to be the way it was going to be, and that was going to be great, too. He never had a doubt. It seemed that the days were good. His favorite thing at the end of a, of a day was to go to the, go play pool with his friend at the bar down the street. And they Fun. would drink a couple red stripes. And that was like his, you know, that's it. That's how he pleased himself. Right. That's very nice. And then you, you boil it down to that and you're like, man, why am I worried about everything? <laughs> Why am I worried about every single thing? Right, right. Um, Just gotta live, baby. You know, I've I will say this: I've been feeling pretty good. You have been. Well, today at least. That's good, man. It's been ups and downs as ever, but uh, I, I'm on. I don't know, day sixteen of no pot. Oh wow, I forgot about that. Yeah. And do you feel that that's making a, a significant impact? It's still too early to tell. Um. At this point, I almost feel like I need to go back to compare from that side. Oh, hilarious. Do you know what I yeah. mean? I need to like You're gonna get high as fuck. Try pot again to be like, is this as good as not doing it was? Because <laughs> I can't remember now what it was like to do it. So your buddy uh 
you guys kind of started this together unknowingly. Yeah, we both decided without speak without conferring right. that we were going to go cold turkey. And then when we found out that we both had stopped, we were very relieved because we were each other's <laughs> biggest enablers, Hilarious. I would say. It's a sign, dude. Has yeah. he has he stuck with it as well? Yeah, he's a he's a, like a week ahead of me. Great. But all of this is to say that um I am working out that's someplace you definitely notice it. Yeah, you have way more sort of like the AM workout, would you say, or um, just in general? Whenever I work out, I, I usually try to work out uh, between like four and six p.m. Oh, interesting. Is that for is that for a reason? I've read that's the best time for. Your I body. have read that as well. Is that why you try to do it like that? It's kind of just the time of my day that yeah. it, that yeah. works. Yeah. Um, for me, but dude. I am in shape again. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm always like not, not that far, right. but the speeds and stuff that I'm doing, the rate at which I can like get through a workout, how, how quickly I can go from one exercise to the next without needing a break or a mm -hmm. long break. You just, that's how you notice it. Like you're ready to pick up the weights again a lot sooner. Right. Um, what about your, your sex life? You don't mind? No, asking. yeah, still pretty um, <laughs> few and far between. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Her job is so intense, and then my job has gotten intense. Yeah. Now that I'm working for myself, and we work one wall apart, mm -hmm. and it's just very hard to switch off from like co-working space friends to lovers right you know what i mean yeah i think we, i've said that we, the, before the we work to pipe city transition yeah you feel like you're long. sexually harassing <laughs> you're like i know i'm not allowed to do this there's probably a, a guideline on the wall Someone somewhere the workplace that prohibits me from going in there and <laughs> kissing her neck oh that's great um we had a good time out in montauk yeah, so back to our original topic. The rain. The rainy weekend. The rain. <laughs> <laughs> the rain. We went we went out to to Montauk uh in you know all the way out in the Hamptons or whatever and we were staying with some our dearest friends, the couple that set us up. Oh, wonderful. Um oh, they have a baby too, right? They have just had their second baby. That was like our one of the first oops clips that I remember was you holding their baby. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. The podcast. That's right. <laughs> yeah. One of, uh, they just had their second. And nice. dude, I got to tell you, you know, I have so many thoughts because I spent the whole weekend holding their babies. Nice. Um, and so now they have like a, an almost two year old who, who I've known since she was a month old. Right. And then they have a three week old. And then my niece is in the middle. Mm -hmm. She's like eight months old, seven months old, November, whatever. So um, I've, I've now seen babies at a lot of different stages of their two years. The, the two-year-old they have is so adorable that I wanted to just hang out with her the whole time. Yeah, yeah. She speaks uh, like somebody who is... I don't even know how to describe does it. She talk, does she refer to herself in the third person? Like no. She, she's not that far along yet? No, she, she doesn't. Most of her stuff is garbled, but there, you know what she's saying. Got it. She, she can point to things. You say, like, what, what, where's your nose? She'll point to her nose. Where's your hair? Right. Point to your eye. Right. Do you want, what do you want? And she'll say, like, baba, meaning I want bottle. a bottle. You know, she knows mama, dada. She called me pop pop. She thought I was her grandfather, <laughs> which once again made me think it's time for Botox. <laughs> we got to uh, get you juiced up, man. I think he's in his <laughs> late 60s, if not 70s. Um, but we quickly dispelled her of that uh, <laughs> misguided thought. <laughs> um, and then she just like we play, you know, she loves to dance and she's got this great giggle. It's great. And it, I will I feel like two two ish is a is an awesome age yeah i will say she needs a lot of attention yeah and yeah. I, that that's all kids at that age right yeah. so you know 
if the lovely couple is listening, I, I'm using your children as a to speak about all children, I think. But um, you that she's no longer like napping for huge spells. She takes one nap, but then the right. rest of the day she's up and you got to be with her. Yeah, like she wakes up at 6 a.m. like a fucking bat out of hell probably, She right? She wakes up later than she that. She starts screaming. But she's she's a risk to herself. Mm-hmm. You can't, you can't yeah. let her do anything. <clears throat> yeah. Because she could get in she could get into an electrical appliance or you know right. she could immediately perish over. at any moment yeah yeah so you re- it's it, it, it and that's stressful <laughs> the stakes are high yeah that's stressful totally um and this couple i mean they are as amazing as they could be because they still maintain that youthful cool vigor and they're beautiful and they're not like worn down by having had kids Mm -hmm. and they're up for hanging and and playing games and and you know drinking and all that it's great and they're amazing and they're just such they're such good teammates that they definitely to me in so many ways uh make parenting seem less scary than i had thought but the kids and their kids are lovely have definitely also affirmed to me that I'm not ready. Yeah. And I think it simply comes down to my career is not in a position where I can spend eight hours a day looking after a child. Right, right. And then everyone's like, well, that's why you get a nanny. And it's like, well, I don't know if I can afford a nanny. You know what I mean? Like, I, so it was a, it was a very, I was, I was studying kind of the whole weekend yeah i was studying how it worked yeah i was studying what was going on and and, and sort of evaluating my own life against it mm-hmm. um i do the same thing every time i'm around a toddler yeah start kind of like taking notes and comparing and seeing like could i do that yeah yeah could this yeah could what would it, it could mean this be my life? what would it change right. for me right it's crazy bro. um and so i'm and and fortunately you know on the drive back i had this the conversation with my girlfriend and She's not ready either. She's mm-hmm. not ready for that. Right. But we definitely, you know, both want kids someday. I say that. D- d- have you ever really thought about it? Yeah, man. And I know what you're going to say. And I, I hate to say that I feel that way too. <laughs> Where I'm like, do I really want kids? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Or are we just saying the company line? This is what I honestly hope. This thought is in my head. And granted, the timing is probably isn't going to work out for this. So I'm willing to obviously make compromises in theory. But, you know, they're getting better at sort of stalling the aging process. Why couldn't I just have kids at 50? And still have 50 years with my kid, in theory. If I, you know, knock on fucking wood, die anytime. Well, because... That's plenty. Because she couldn't. Correct. But, you know, freeze her eggs or whatever. I don't know. Like, I don't know how any of this shit works, obviously. How would Hill Dog take it? If I don't you think said, she would like this. If you said to her, like, maybe I'd be open to have kid, having kids at 50. Uh, she'd be like, I don't know. She'd probably just like s- say that that isn't possible <laughs> like, or something. I don't know. But this is the thing. Hill Dog, fortunately, is significantly younger than me. So I still have some time. Mm-hmm. Um, which is nice. And again, dude, it's really hard to anticipate how you're going to feel about things in the future. And I, 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 su- I suggest to all of you that you don't assume how you're going to feel and just assume that you will be ready when you're ready and it will make sense at the time. Fucking hell, dude. N- nothing has made sense to me at the time. Right. I have been oh, oh. shooting from the hip and taking left <laughs> turns at a moment's notice for a decade fine but 12 th- years think about some of the things that you can do now and some of the things that you can afford and some of the some of the ways you live your life and then think about 10 years ago if you were thinking about how you had to be doing the things that you're not comfortably doing that may have stressed you out quite a bit including having a dog and yeah, liking it fine you know what i mean like there's there's so many things like that mm-hmm. that being like, I'm going to have kids when I'm 45 and then I'm going to do this when I'm that. I'm going to do this when I'm that. I know people who do that and they're always, they're consistently wrong about the it's things dumb. they thought they wanted. That's in their dumb. Life. I agree with that. And then I'm going to graduate this and then I'm going to go get a master's and then I'm going to do that and then I'm going to become this. And then by the time I'm this, I'm going to be that. Yes. But how does going from, 
I know that I am not ready for children turn into I might be warming up to the idea turns into I am ready. How does that happen? Any parent of like our generation of parents will just immediately say you're never ready. <laughs> that's a that's the popular line that I've so, heard. So you're never so ready. Is every childhood is every is every pregnancy a mistake then? Like I, I like no, I'm sure plenty of people plan it, but this idea of like you're never really going to be ready, but it will change your life in the most rewarding way seems to be a pretty popularly prevailing thought. Okay, I had this thought too. I don't think that the world needs more of me. <laughs> so there's a part of me that thinks that me having children is a, a selfish act. And I, I, I'm very open to the idea of adopting. Interesting. So you think... I would just... love to adopt a three-year-old. Wow. Then you skip all the tough stuff. Um, they're in a good sleep pattern. They're house trained. <laughs> they are, you know, talking. They're doing their own math homework. They're going. <laughs> they're going to school. I guess. Yeah, they can maybe yeah, dress I mean, themselves. They're not shitting. Okay, on but that, things. that's different than you saying that you think that you, creating another you would somehow be a bad thing. Which I'd like to hear more about why you feel that way. Yeah, you just think you have issues that you don't want to give to someone else. Okay, let's put it this way. Okay. Obama should have had nine kids. The Obamas should have had 10 kids. The world benefits from having more Obamas. Okay, fine. But you're, you're a decorated person in theory. Like on paper, what's wrong with your resume? Why, um, why is that not desirable? It is on paper. Uh, you know better than we do. Imagine, imagine eight Francis children going to work at Barstool and getting fired for writing about dead girls. Okay, but I, I don't know that that's <laughs> but they're adding not be a lot exactly of like you. value to the world. They're not going to be exactly Francis clones. You know, you're not cloning yourself. You're just having kids. And also, dude, listen, the bar, the Barstool thing wasn't even your fault, dude. Yeah, well, <laughs> potato, tomato. All all of this, you know. Okay, so so whatever. I'm hum. I feel like I'm humble enough to know that I just I've divorced myself from the idea that I want to, I want to create another version of myself that I want to continue my legacy through my children or that I I need to expand the family line or some ridiculous Viking reasoning <laughs> behind having kids. So you don't feel any sort of like any sort of gratifying feeling at the prospect of continuing your your heritage and keeping your name alive and all that stuff. That doesn't excite you at all? Um, no. No. Okay. In fact, <laughs> and, and this is this is why I, I said and I was glad you agreed a little bit, which is like, well, I don't know that I need kids. Yeah. I have so many things I like to do, like I I don't need something else to do right now. I don't need something that's going to take me away from all the things I like exactly, to do. Exactly. Exactly. I feel that way very much. I love doing stuff, dude. Which made then <laughs> then which then comes down to this. It's like to me is the only reason that I would have kids just to make my wife happy, to give her what what I know she wants. Well, dude, I you know, I think as you you get older and your life becomes less this is the thought that I have. You 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 get older and being old and not having a family is like seems pretty fucking lonely to me yeah but then you watch the sex in the city movie <laughs> you're like they can make brunch reservations whenever they <laughs> want dude but think about your you start getting old old you know and now you have this family that's like you created this family tree and you can live vicariously through them and their stories and you can love them and have it be low maintenance, like go live your life. And that gives you joy and you don't feel alone. And like the idea of like being all fucking alone and dying alone sounds terrible to me. Hmm. <laughs> okay. That's, that's probably true. Now that begs the question. If do you subscribe to this idea that you don't want to be a, an old dad, someone who's too creaky to lift his kid out of the pool or something like that? Do you want to be a you young know, parent who can throw have a catch without needing to ice his shoulder? So this this is interesting. I I have found and I suspect that many of the people that I know who have old parents, quote unquote, have had some issues because of it. 
Interesting. I'm serious. And, and, and I'm, I'm not meaning to generalize if any of you guys fall into that boat and you feel that you're well adjusted and don't have issues. But some of the people that I knew who had, quote, old parents had some, some, some extra things that other people didn't have. It seemed like. I'm judging. Mm. I'm judging. But that's so I would hate to do that to them. I see. To be like, you're thinking about your parents' mortality from a super young age. And like, and maybe like you said, your parents aren't as mobile and as, and maybe they're more available because presumably they're retired. So maybe <laughs> yeah. that can be nice. Um, but I have thought about that. Mm. Like there's certainly an age where it, you're, you start to get too old. But as you know, being in New York City now, and maybe this is a money thing, but there's so many New York City kids who have older parents. Mm. Like it seems as if the kind of median age for how old people's parents are is much older than the parents of the people that I was around when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's to, to to your point, it, like establishing yourself in a place like this where it's so much more expensive, it makes it much harder to kind of start a family younger or something. Maybe it just boils down to logistics. Mm -hmm. So I don't think 50 is too old though. I'll say that. You, uh, you would be totally fine being a 50 year old father. Yeah. Okay. The issue that I have with that, <laughs> I, th I think I, again, no fucking idea. For me, you're 60 when they're 10. Yeah. That's, that's a big, that's big. 60's pretty young, dude. If you're healthy. All right. So where does it get weird? 70, 20? 70, 20 isn't even that bad. The kid's going to college and you're 70. You're showing up at his dorm to help move his futon in and you. I don't think that's that bad. Stop to take your citalopram or your. <laughs> cholesterol medicine no dude hopefully you're that guy who's like the doctor says i got a heart of a 40 year old <laughs> hopefully you're that guy can't, can't help move in because it's a walk up <laughs> i mean dude listen i don't like that that seems to me like the furthest where in my mind i could stretch it to and not feel stressed about it 50 is 50 that's your cutoff that's my cutoff. all right but I, i'm assuming i'll start having them in my 40s What's your ideal age at which you would have your first child? Well, dude, it just really depends on so many things. Come on. Give me what, give me a number for you. Dude, or say I made a fucking million dollars or whatever. We have to be maybe more than that. Say I made $10 million randomly. It's luckily I'd be ready much sooner. Not knowing your financial horizon, not okay. knowing anything other than who you are and where you are right now in your life. Assuming that there isn't some kind of crazy significant change to my earning potential and things progress as they do. I, I, let's say 42. 42? Yeah. 42. Yeah. That's eight years from now? Roughly. Interesting. 42 feels... I certainly can't push it to 42. Yeah. I'm not going to have that much. Assuming, yeah, assuming things work out for you, for you too, which it appears they will. You guys seem like you have a great relationship. I got like two or three I years. I think you got a few years. I got like three, probably three years at most. Yeah. That's yeah. how much I'm allowed. Yeah. I'm allowed a bit more um, because um, of Hill Dog's age. Mm. Um, but again, we'll see, dude. Stresses me out. For sure, it stresses me out. <laughs> but it's like you said. It's like you said, you know, we have no idea where we'll be in a year, I guess, or two years. I don't know. Yeah. Well, dude, listen, you know, you're, it's going to be a stressful time. You're going to be doing a lot of different things. You're going to be kneeling to propose. You're going to be dancing on that wedding dance floor. You're going to be sitting in the hospital while she gives birth and you're going to have to be wearing comfortable clothes. And there's a pair of pants that you can do all of those activities. Is in. there? And those are called the old bird diddly dogs. The baby. bird dogs. The bird dogs. Let me tell you something. I was with the, <laughs> I, the the couple that we were hanging out with this weekend. He has a younger, my buddy has a younger brother mm -hmm. who is 21 or something. And he saw that I was wearing bird dogs. Mm -hmm. And he was like, dude, those are the only shorts I wear. Really? He's like, I bought six pairs last summer and my <laughs> buddy stole four of them. <laughs> We all just steal each other's bird dogs. They're the best shorts I've They're ever so worn. Good. It's all we wear. It's so good. That's what he said. And I was like, Jesus. Yeah, I love that we're, we're, we now have testimonials for the pod. Yeah, man. <laughs> Pete from San Francisco. That's it. <laughs> Kyle from Onondaga Nation. That's not, he's not actually of the nation, but they live up that way. The oh, point is, uh, they, they, they are the best. I'm wearing them right now. It's all I wear in the summer. They're great. The shorts have this built-in underwear liner, but they're not, they don't ride up. They're comfortable. They're so great. The pants are great too. 
Um, they're quick drying. They're they're stretchy. They're they look good. They're just everything you need in a short. They're phenomenal. If you go to birddogs.com right now. Use your promo code. Oops, you're gonna get something. <laughs> we don't know what it is, but you'll get it, and you'll enjoy it along with your bird dogs. Do it now. Get in there. Get your bird dogs. Get in there. Love it, dude. Um, I heard a funny story this weekend from somebody. So I I was out in your area as well. Um, different sort of vibe, but the same kind of thing. You know, we couldn't do much because it was dumping fucking rain mm. harder than I've ever seen in this area consistently. Right, mm-hmm. three straight days of just dumping. Um, but we were playing board games and stuff. Um, one of which you gave to me. Yes. And uh, it was really fun. I, Secret Hitler. It's called Secret Hitler. It's a strange name to say on the podcast. Yeah. You almost feel like you're going to get in trouble for saying, but that's the name <laughs> of the game. Yeah, it's called Secret Hitler. And, you know, very quickly, if you, if you want to break down, I, f- I feel like you're the it's one. It's a role who, playing game. It's a little bit like you got to figure out who the bad guys are. They're secretive. Yeah, uh, you don't know who the bad guys are at the table. And it's it, what's fun is that everyone has these roles and, and, and you, for the round, you have to figure out who they are. And you can hurl accusations at each other. It's fun. And it, it gets almost personal. It's a great game. Um, and and you you lie to each other. Your whole intention is to disguise who you are, and uh, it's the fascists versus the liberals. And it's really fun. And yeah. essentially, I played with Francis uh, a few times, and they kind of taught me how to play. And I sort of loosely knew how to play. And we were with ten people, which is the perfect number of people to play the game with. And I had a couple of fucking Cockersons in me and I had that liquid courage and I was like, I can fucking handle this. A couple of Cocker Spaniels. A couple of Cocker Spaniels. And I was able to sort of like teach people the game and we had a great time. It was really fun. Did not one single person other than you know how to play? Not one single person. Wow. That is a tall order. And and kudos to them for having the attention span to receive the information yeah. of learning the game especially if people were drunk it was it ended up being great man it was a wow. lot of fun um and a guy at the table told a really funny story that i wanted to share i thought this was great good so we were talking about the i the, the kind of concept of being wasted or like hung over at work a night after like a, a, a really heavy night of drinking early in your career and you got to go in the office friday morning and like you're going to the bathroom to puke you're having a rough fucking day but you you have to go you can't not go to the office Mm -hmm. you know so this guy told a great story he's like dude i was dying he's like i went into the bathroom to kind of like sit on the toilet smoke the jewel and like rest for a couple minutes he goes i woke up three hours later (laughs) (laughs) i looked at my phone i panicked he goes i ran out walked back to my desk nobody noticed (laughs) i was like what an amazing story and what does he do I think he works in some kind of like finance environment yeah. where like you theoretically would get caught for that. Yeah. This like the sort of like work hard, play hard environment is a place where you get called out for that. Yeah. You can't call in sick Friday morning. Mm-mm. You have to have the plague because otherwise they'll think, oh, you went a little too hard last night. Yeah. And they, then they say your last name. Mm-hmm. Oh, you went too hard last night, huh, Ellis? Yeah. So, yeah. Fridays, <laughs> Fridays and Mondays, if you're in finance, I feel like are the days that you can't, when, especially when you're young. You can't call out. You cannot uh, call out sick. Dude, <laughs> our buddy Bill that yeah. you know. God bless him. Dude, Bill. One of the great guys, this guy. Bill has a compilation of photos of himself <laughs> taking taxis to work on Fridays. <laughs> Where he is in such bad shape. That's great. And all they all have like the caption of like, oh my God, kill me now. <laughs> and dude, some of these <laughs> some of these pictures, his eyes are so bloodshot from lack of sleep. You could just see that you can smell the the alcohol pouring out of his <laughs> veins. Picture. You know, it's like uh, when you're 24, 20, for, you know, second year analyst or whatever it is. And you just think you're invincible on Thursday <laughs> nights because all it takes is you get through it like once or twice. And yes. you're like, you, then you forget. It's you start like that, pushing the envelope. It's like that thing totally in childbirth true. that women have where it's like they have a blocker, uh, a memory blocker of the actual of how pain. How bad it felt. Yeah, because if they didn't, That's they crazy. would remember it and then they'd never want to do it again. That's crazy. I feel like he was the same way or like, so, you know, when you're young, you just so accurate. You just block out the pain of those hangovers and. Then somehow by like two or three p.m. you're feeling a little better, and then you go out again. I on know, Friday I, I night. dude, I know it's incredible. Oh, ah, God. youth. <laughs> yeah. What's uh? What's the worst? You, I mean, you told me that you used when you were teaching tennis. Oh that there were God. days you'd show up on the court and you'd have to 
really suck it up. Dude, so this is a good this is a good one. Um, so we lived in a in a tennis house together. So they put us up in this house. We had to pay for it, but like, and we were all bunking up. So three bedroom house. I know exactly where it is. It's on Montauk Highway. And when I drive by it, I always point it out. People are like, we know, dude, we know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so I was rooming with my buddy Gustavo, great guy, and uh, this girl Kristen who lived with us. She had her friends from the University of South Carolina visiting, mm. and they were like, kind of wild party girl types right sounds fun so dude they get there really late and it's it's like one or two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning i'm like i need to go to bed like i have to play in the morning it's gonna be i have a full day of teaching i need to go to bed so i like go to bed and i leave the party and like everybody's drunk there's these girls were hot too i was like god damn it this sucks i get in bed dude i wake up to one of the girls just getting in bed with me I was like, oh my God. Holy Toledo. And she was like a senior. Like it was just like one of the greatest moments of like of my life at the time. (laughs) I was like, this is the most incredible thing ever. And then naturally, you know, we're up all night. I don't sleep a minute. And I then have to go on court and teach the entire day the next day from 8 a.m. until 7 p.m. the entire day. And dude, teaching, you don't get to like take a break. You don't get to sit and look at your phone. Like you're on. You're like, all right, another, like, come on. Like it is hard fucking work with no break. Yeah. And I wanted to die. But like, was it worth it? I think, you know, of course. It's worth it because you told the story today on Oops the Podcast. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. A man from a different time. You know, dude. And that's like back then you can get through it. Like you said, by 2 p.m. you're feeling a little better. Yeah. Now it doesn't work that way. No. By 2 p.m. the next day, you're still not feeling better. No. You know? Now I'm and trying to I think, need a nap. I'm trying to think if something like that happened to me now, what I would do. I would just invent some wacky lie about why I couldn't be there anymore. Yeah. yeah. I would I would have to lie my way out of it, which I'm not proud of, but my body can't take that. Yeah, I know. Do you ever but do you have like a work one? Cuz now I'm thinking about it, like tennis is fine, but it's like a summer job. It's still like what about like when you were dressing up Dude, when to I go was, to work? When I was a a junior intern at the Royal Bank of Scotland out in Stamford, Connecticut. Oh, yeah? I, and maybe I've told this before, but It was coming to the end of the summer. I had not cut my hair once from the day that I got there. Rally cap. It's like two and a half months, three months in. And um, I think I was growing my hair out for my lacrosse season my senior year because I just didn't care. (laughs) I wanted some flow. Love it. Um, And I went out in New York on a Thursday night the next day I had like my evaluation oh, God. Um, and sort of, I, I, you know, I, I knew I was going into that. I, I wore, I ended up spending the night at my buddy's apartment on his couch, even though I only lived like <laughs> seven blocks away. <laughs> Cause we Could just got easily gone. We home. got so banged up that I was like, I can't, I'd rather just get yeah an extra 30 minutes of sleep <laughs> then walk home and whatever and i had to take i had to get up early to take the get, to get to grand central to take the train uh, yeah. out to stanford were you able to go home first did you wear the no same clothes? I, I wore the clothes that oh, i yeah. had gone out in oh, yeah. which might have been the clothes that i had worn to work the day before oh yeah and i remember you know maybe i showered in the morning at best <laughs> at their apartment and then just like went to work And I, at one point, I had to get up from work and go to this, I had to go to this evaluation, and I walked over, and I had, like, stains on my shirt, and my hair was nuts. Oh, no. And I wasn't shaved, and uh, I... I don't even think, I think like one half of my shirt was tucked in, like <laughs> one side, you know, and the other wasn't. And <laughs> I went up and I like shook hands with them and they were like, I mean, clearly we're not going to make you an offer oh my to come God, back. Really? But, but they knew I didn't even want it. Did you, you did not want it? No. <laughs> At that point I was committed, first of all, to not going to, into finance. Mm-hmm. I had made that decision halfway through the summer. Got it, got it. Got I still it. showed up for work every day because I was getting paid. Dude, but... I love you showing up in the my wife just left me uniform. 
the shirt half tucked. <laughs> I mean, to tell some 21 year old kid, like, listen, man, you got to get your life together. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but I, 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 look, they said that to me and then I was like, yeah, no, I, I know. Like I, I, there was no part of me that was like, oh, well, I've had a great time. You know, it was like, I, I you know, I would have said no if you had offered me. More like Royal Bank of suck my dick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, yeah. Totally, totally. And I'd spent the last <laughs> two months of that job every day, basically just writing jokes at my desk. Oh, wow. Um, that my keyboard had like a slide out drawer and I had a pad next to the keyboard and I was writing jokes the whole time. And that was when I got back to school and organized a stand-up comedy show and performed all the material that I had written that summer. That was the first show I ever did. That's Dude, it's so funny how our, the, we have a lot of parallels, man. Hillary mm. pointed that out to me, but it is true. Like just random little things like that. Like we both went to school in Boston. We both like kind of worked for a very short period of time before getting into comedy. There's, yeah. there's lots of them, but same thing with me. I wrote, I was writing jokes when I was supposed to be working. Sorry, Zach. That was my boss's name at the time. Mm. Um, and it was one of those things where he like directly hires you too. It's not like the company hired me. Like he was paying me out of his pocket. I think I tried. I mean, I got, I lined up one deal for them. I think that he told yeah. me, he said, call these people. Anyway. What was um, that in? What field of work was re commercial that Commercial real estate. Oh yeah. Um, and anyway, he, uh, but I was writing jokes down and like signing up for my first shows and stuff. And then it was mm. a quick, transition into comedy there you but go good shit man well hell yeah uh that's hoops the podcast everybody we appreciate you so much for listening and hopefully you can take some kind of thoughts or advice anything from this um we appreciate you guys sending us your stories and travails to oops the podcast at gmail.com follow the instagram and we will see you next thursday